Number 10, the Fury. Generally depicted as an enemy of Captain Britain and the X-Men, the Fury is a deadly android built by the reality manipulating psychic Mad Jim Jaspers of the parallel timeline of Earth 238 to destroy all superhumans but himself. Since it's not a living being, it doesn't possess any superpowers. However, it's ridiculously strong, can generate lethal energy blasts, is capable of adapting to any situation, and can regenerate its mechanical body at will. Most of the Fury's enemies on Earth 238 were based on British comic book characters from the 1950s to the 1970s. After succeeding in its mission, the Fury was deactivated until Captain Britain and his elf sidekick Jack Daw were sent to Earth 238 by the Captain's mythic mentor Merlin. The status crew and forces working for the country's oppressive regime reactivate the Fury and send it to kill the hero, and it murdered Jack Daw and then killed Captain Britain. After a little bit, it traveled to Earth 616 and continued killing many of Captain Britain's allies until it was eventually taken down and buried in the cave system of Captain Britain's mansion, where it absorbed the circuitry of the computer and repaired itself. There's a bit more to its story, but hey, I don't want to spoil it all for you guys, so give it a read for yourself, starting with 1982's Marvel Super Heroes UK, number 387. Number 9, Sugar Man. One of the most terrifying looking villains on our list today is Sugar Man, the villain with a terrifyingly powerful tongue, size and mass alteration abilities, and highly advanced regeneration ability. Originally, he ran the human work camps in the Pacific Northwest and was a geneticist with a lab around Niagara Falls, where he regularly tormented his captives. Magneto needed a mutant with chrono variant powers, aka time traveling powers, in order to go back in time to restore reality's proper order before Charles Xavier's death. And Ileana Rasputin was revealed to be one of the few around, so Colossus and Generation Next were sent to return. Her. Sugar Man held up pretty well against them, only almost dying like three times. He eventually hitched a ride to the Apocalypse Citadel and was transported from his native Earth of 295 to Earth 616 where he operated with Genosha to help the Magistrates create a mutant captive army that could take over the world. So not only is he scary looking, he is also scary smart. Can't imagine them sticking him into any X-Men movie, let alone an MCU movie anytime soon, so in the meantime check him out in comic form starting with his first appearance in 1995's Generation Next. Number 2 Number 8, Super Giant. Although the other members of the Black Order made an appearance in the MCU, one member was unfortunately shafted, and that is none other than Super Giant, the mentally unstable omnipath and telepathic parasite who seeks out intellect and devours it. In the comics, Super Giant had absolutely no issues with taking out the Jean Grey school and the X-Men associated with it. Later on, when the Black Order seized Wakanda, Super Giant was left in control of Black Bolt, whom she would mentally order to activate the bombs the Illuminati hid in Wakanda's necropolis. Upon activating the bomb, Super Giant was faced by Maximus, who had the trigger, and Max Maximus triggered the bomb, but also used Lockjaw to transport Supergiant along with the bomb to a distant uninhabited planet where she perished in the explosion of the bomb. Although she did later return as a mental projection and even attempted to take over the body of Captain Glory so she could continue wreaking havoc on the world. Thankfully though, she was eventually taken out for good by the Lethal Legion while trying to take over Thor's mind. Check her out for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 2013's Infinity, number one. Number 7, Kull Borson. Born the older brother of Odin, Kull Borson, aka Serpent, is the god of fear in the Asgardian world. He possesses all the conventional attributes of an Asgardian god. However, as the son of Bor, many of these attributes are significantly better than those possessed by the majority of his race. He possesses enough superhuman strength to shatter Captain America's shield with his bare hands, has the ability to manipulate magic as he's able to teletransport, revive the dead, and transform himself into a giant serpent. And as the god of fear, he could consume the fear of other people to empower himself, making him stronger and even younger in the process. During the Fear Itself storyline, Kull created and gathered his worthy in order to spread chaos across the entire world. This group being made up of Juggernaut as Kurth, Breaker of Stone, Hulk as Null, Breaker of Worlds, Atuma as Nurkod, Breaker of Oceans, Titania as Skurn, Breaker of Men, Grey Gargoyle as Mock, Breaker of Faith, Absorbing Man as Grey Thoth, Breaker of Wills, and Thing as Angrier, Breaker of Souls. Thor was eventually able to kill him in the storyline after some intense battles, but not without losing his own life in the process. Obviously though, both characters do come back to life eh, just a little bit later on. However, Cull meets his permanent end in 2019's Thor Volume 5, number 13. Want to know what led up to that point? Well, check out this whole story for yourself, starting with 2011's Fear Itself, number 1. Number 6, Cassandra Nova. This powerful telepath is certainly not well known among general audiences and has actually never been introduced in any of the movies whatsoever. Cassandra Nova is essentially a member of a parasitic race of psychic beings and attaches herself to Charles Xavier while he's still in the womb. She absorbed the darkest parts of his mind and basically became Charles's twin sister. Though the doctors pronounce her stillborn, Cassandra in fact survived and spent the next few decades as a growing mass of cells in a sewer wall, building a new body for herself and planning her revenge on her brother. 
Since she copied the DNA of Charles, this means that she is able to access the full spectrum of his powers, making her one of, if not the strongest telepath, because this means she has all the powers of Charles Xavier, meaning the ones that he has had and the ones that he might receive in the future as a result of any latent mutations. Overall, she is a dangerous enemy of the X-Men, having made an army of Sentinels murder over 16 million mutants on the island of Genosha, and that by itself is a reason she is on this list today. Check her out for yourself in 2001's new X-Men number 144, and let me know your thoughts on her in the comments below. Number 5. Vox. Maximus Boltagon, aka Vox, is an inhuman and son to two of the top geneticists at Attilid. Subjected to the DNA-altering Terrigan mist when he was an infant, Maximus peculiarly showed no outward sign of any mutagenic change. Although as he matured, he hid his developing psionic powers from the community, but was less successful in disguising his antisocial tendencies. His mental powers granted by the mutagenic effects of the Terrigan mist give him the ability to numb, override, and even get rid of a person's mind. He has the ability to induce short-term amnesia in others, and the ability to exchange his consciousness with another person as well. He does seem to have a limited range though, but it is made up through variability, as he's only able to affect minds in a certain radius and only create one effect at a time. His influence generally functions while Maximus concentrates, but he has been known to leave long buried influences in his subjects as well, which he can trigger by voice command, causing a subject to carry out embedded commands, forget something, or even remember something. In the recent Death of the Inhuman storyline, Maximus is that new Arctillon when the Kree begin their campaign to get the Inhumans to join them or die. The superhuman Vox and the Kree with him are on new Arctillon and begin murdering every Inhuman they come across, old or new. Armed with all the Inhuman's abilities and no humanity whatsoever, Vox easily cuts his prey down with his powers or with his literal energy sight. Even Maximus cannot defeat Vox as he quickly loses an arm for even making the attempt to try and do so. It was later revealed that the Kree took his body and placed it in a Vox costume where he was brainwashed to serve the Kree. When Beta Ray Bill took down Vox during his confrontation with Black Bolt, it broke the brainwashing on Maximus as something on Vox's costume teleport her way while also killing Maximus in the process. Number 4, Mad Jim Jaspers. Mentioned briefly at the beginning of our list when I was talking about the Fury, Mad Jim Jaspers is not a super well-known villain, but just because they're not well-known doesn't mean that they're not scary. He has a truly terrifying power, which is the ability to shift and twist reality however he sees fit, making him without a doubt one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe, having powers beyond the cosmic entities. Couple that with the fact that he's, well, mad, and you get something out of a David Lynch nightmare that you do not want to mess with. Jaspers regularly twists the world into the nightmare hellscape he believes reality to be. And this, as you can imagine, leads to some imaginative and horrifying scenarios. According to Merlin, the 616 Jaspers is just way too powerful, stating this version of Jaspers is too powerful, too dangerous. His 238 counterpart could at least be halted, even if it meant destroying his entire continuum. This one, however, is not so easily containable, and if he can't be defeated, then the Omniverse shall fall into chaos and a new hostile god shall play dice with the matter. Now, if you want to know more about the character, then check him out in his first appearance in 1983's Daredevil, number 9. Number 3, Mr. Sinister. Nathaniel Essex is the supervillain commonly associated with the X-Men, known as Mr. Sinister. He is an incredibly ruthless and sadistic man who has no problems doing whatever he deems necessary to get what he wants, including, you know, mass murder. Thanks to having his genetics altered by Apocalypse, he was transformed from a regular world human into a superhuman capable of some ridiculous things like shapeshifting, telepathy, telekinesis, concussive blasts, and can't forget that he also has super strength, speed, stamina, durability, and reflexes. Sinister is also a scientific genius with expertise in the field of biology, genetics, cloning, physics, and engineering. The character is a master manipulator and planner with decades of genetic research at his command. He goes to great lengths to preserve his powers and personality through elaborate technology logical means, such as conditioning certain children to be his quote-unquote host in the event of his future death. Over the course of his time in comics, we have seen him go up against the likes of so many heroes and come out relatively unscathed, and that is why he is so high up on our list today. Check him out for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1987's Uncanny X-Men number 221. Number 2, Chaos King. Amatsu Mikabashi is none other than the Chaos King, the god of evil, chaos, and the stars to the followers of the Shinto religion in Japan. He possessed the conventional abilities of one of the kami, the order of Japanese deities such as superhuman strength, speed, durability, agility, endurance, and recuperative abilities, as well as high ability to wield some form of potent Japanese magic, a brand of sorcery that seems especially effective against the Olympian deities. His physical strength, at least in his main incarnation, is considerably less to that of like Zeus or Izanami and is roughly equal to that of an average Kami. But Mikabashi can project energy on a scale at least rivaling that of Zeus and Izanagi as well. 
Like the Asgardians, the Japanese gods are extremely long-lived, but not truly immortal like the Olympians, as they tend to age at an extremely low rate upon reaching adulthood, and are three times denser than normal human beings. During the events of the Chaos War, we catch a glimpse of Chaos King teamed up with Necra and none other than the Grim Reaper and Abomination to fight against the other gods. He even goes as far as unleashing Carrion Crow, Eater of the Dead, to antagonize the revived X-Men members. All in all, he is brutal in terms of methods and isn't too easy on the eyes either, so check him out for yourself, starting with 2006's Thor, Blood Oath, number 6. And number one, the first firmament. At the very beginning of it all, there was only one universe, the first firmament. For a long time, the first firmament was the sole being in creation until its loneliness became unbearable and it decided to create the first life in creation to give itself companions as well as servants, which it eventually came to regret. It created two specific types. Black servants dutifully obeyed and worshiped their creator and then the multicolored ones had completely different values and desires as they wanted a dynamic, diverse, and continually evolving reality. Where being lived, learned, reproduced, aged, and died in order to slowly improve themselves through evolution. Unfortunately for them, when the creations argued with their creator, they were destroyed completely. Now one can only imagine what might happen if an entire universe were to turn evil, but this is the answer to that question, since the first firmament became the evil that many people worry about. Just imagine an emo sentient galaxy that could destroy pretty much anything with just a gesture. Absolutely terrifying and way too much for the MCU. Check it out for yourself in its first full appearance in 2017's Ultimates 2, Volume 2, Number five. Number 10, Man Bat. The Man Bat is not always a villain of Batman's. He has been known to sometimes be an ally as well. But when Dr. Kirk Langstrom is in his Man Bat form, he is always horrifying. So horrifying that the closest thing we got to him was in one of Batman's nightmares from Batman v Superman in the DCEU. However, this wasn't really specified to be man bad specifically. Dr. Langstrom aimed to create a serum to help the deaf and blind, but accidentally made a serum that also transformed anyone who used it into a giant bat like creature. Both he and his wife suffer from its effects at one point, becoming the man bat and she bat, respectively. It would be cool to see a horror style Batman film featuring these two monstrous and sometimes villainous characters. Number 9, Solomon Grundy. While he's appeared in lots of animated films, Solomon Grundy has yet to make his debut in the live action world of the DCEU. This could be because of his monstrous appearance. Solomon Grundy is a zombie-like villain who sometimes ends up as a hero depending on the circumstances. He has a Frankenstein type vibe to him as well, which likely makes him too monster-like for the likes of the DCEU. Although there are so many horror-inspired characters and villains in DC comics that would be cool to see if that genre made its way more into the films. Horror DC, I would watch those movies. <laughs> Number 8. Hugo Strange Hugo Strange has a place in the television series Gotham where he is played by B.D. Wong, and is depicted as the chief of psychiatry at Arkham Asylum. But we have yet to see the insane mad scientist make an appearance in the DC Extended Universe. Because he is often closely tied these days to Arkham Asylum both in the comics and in the Batman video games, it would be kind of hard to introduce this madman who has a tendency to experiment on patients and transform them into monsters into the DCEU without first introducing the famed Asylum. Hugo is a formidable and frightening Batman foe, not just because of how insane he is, but because of how brilliant he is too. It's a perfect plan. With this machine, I can imagine Batman to be anyone I choose. And these fools will pay a fortune for it. He was even able to use his smarts and deductive reasoning to uncover Batman's true identity. Number 7. Mr. Mixie Piz Yiddelik. So, Mr. Mixie might not be horrifying to look at. He's kind of silly looking, truth be told. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be scared of him. He has more power than you can possibly imagine. And in fact, anything that he can imagine can come to pass, should he will it. The only limit to his reality altering powers are the limitations of his own imagination. Like Batman's Joker, he has at times claimed to be the ultimate Superman foe. In one story to prove this, he even killed all of Superman's enemies and allies just to prove how evil he was. Mr. Mixie also forced Superman to kill him as well, forcing Superman to break his own moral code. Ooh, Talk about being on Joker's terrifying level of ultimate villainy. Oh, I don't feel so good. 
but it's still worth it. Number six, James Gordon Jr. He might not be on Mr. Mixie's level in terms of his power set, but James Gordon Jr. is one terrifying and creepy villain. As his name implies, he is related to Commissioner Gordon and is in fact his son. Surprisingly, James is not like his dad and grows up instead to become a psychotic serial killer, exhibiting early warning signs from a young age that there is something very wrong with him. He used to pick apart and torture animals and was suspected as being involved in the disappearance of one of Barbara's friends, Bess Keller. Though, nothing was ever proven. He ends up returning to Gotham and is revealed to be a full out serial killer who enjoys torturing his victims to death in Black Mirror. Later on, he ends up joining the Suicide Squad and becomes the team's strategy analyzer. Man, I would not want to work with James Gordon Jr. on the Suicide Squad. I'd be like, Ugh. No thanks. Number five, Papa Midnight. Papa Midnight is a villain to John Constantine for the most part. Sometimes he's an ally, but more often he's not, as the man is obsessed with power and is a pretty bad dude. Papa Midnight grew up in Trenchtown, Jamaica. Born Linton Midnight, from a young age, he became inspired by tales of dark magic that his parents had told him. He betrayed a group of slaves, conning them into believing that they would be protected if they rebelled, which led to their deaths, and later went on to sell his sister's soul into demon slavery so that he could achieve more power for himself through using her soul as a barter chip, selling it to the demons of hell. Ooh. Considering how violent and insidious Papa Midnight is, we likely won't be seeing him in the DCEU, although he has managed to make an appearance in the CW Arrowverse, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> Number four, Crib. How does one even make a villain like Crib in the DCEU, just from a visual standpoint? Like, ooh, that'd be a lot of effects, I think. Crib is a member of the Sinestro Corps. She is described as being an alien hag and is 100% something out of a nightmare. Lots of Baba Yaga vibes here as well. However, instead of being associated with eating children, as Baba Yaga sometimes is, Crib's purpose is to kidnap the newly born children of Green Lanterns who are also parents. Crib will even go to the lengths of giving her pregnant victims four cesareans in order to secure their children. Ugh. She keeps the kidnapped newborns in her hunchback, which looks like a creepy bone crib, and promptly kills the parents of any children whom she has taken away. What's more disturbing is it's never explained why Crib has this compulsion. It's just something she feels inspired to do. I guess she doesn't think Green Lanterns make for great parents? She's like, I'll be a way better parent to these babies with my weird bone crib. Super qualified. Number three, Dollmaker. Dollmaker has a horrific origin, which makes it hard to introduce him without going full horror film mode. When Barton Mathis was young, he would go camping with his father, who it turns out was a serial killer. While camping, Barton would not only witness his father kill people, but also commit acts of cannibalism. He also saw his father killed when apprehended by the police. Years later, Mathis would grow up to be a gifted, but deranged surgeon, who was obsessed with using his victim's body parts to craft dolls. He wears a mask made of human skin and was the one who helped Joker to remove his face during the lead up to the death of the family storyline. Number two, a Black Lantern Corps. One of the most terrifying villain groups of both appearance wise and in terms of their threat level is the Black Lantern Corps. Of course, this would be a hard supervillain group to introduce, being that we'd likely need Green Lanterns to be on the scene to help explain, well, just who the Black Lantern Corps are and why we should care about them. After all, you can't defeat the Black Lantern Corps anyways without the entire emotional spectrum of lanterns assembled to help create that white lantern power. This threat might also just be too huge and horrific to make an appearance due to the sheer size of their numbers. In the Blackest Night storyline, they were like an overwhelmingly sized zombie apocalypse level of threat, killing heroes and resurrecting them to join their deadly ranks. Number one, Batman Who Laughs. It might be a little too confusing for the DCEU to introduce the Batman Who Laughs, as that would mean they'd likely have to involve the dark multiverse somewhere in their films, and the dark multiverse is likely too dark even for DC to make that happen on the big screen. The Batman Who Laughs is an alternate version of Batman who was infected by Joker Venom after being pushed too far by the villain, causing him to lash out and kill the Joker, snapping his neck. This caused Batman to become infected, driving him insane, and causing him to take down his own world's Justice League and kill his own Bat family, save for Damian Wayne, who he convinced to join him. He's one of the biggest bads in DC's current storylines. Number 10, Vermin. 
Edward Whelan from Earth 616 had a pretty average childhood aside from his abusive father, which is actually what led him to the streets and crime. Now it's not exactly known when, but at some point he got the attention of Baron Zemo and was subjected to many tests that gave him various rat-like traits and abilities. Aside from the obvious rat-like appearance, his, his strength, stamina, speed, and durability were boosted to superhuman levels, and he also gained the ability to communicate with and command rats that are up to two miles away. After gaining these powers, he was sent out to end Captain America, however, he ended up being overpowered by Cap and taken back to S.H.I.E.L.D. for interrogation. He managed to escape fairly quickly though, and since then he has been a pretty big thorn in both Captain America and Spider-Man's sides. However, they have actually used him to their advantage sometimes, as Spidey once used him as bait for Kraven the Hunter. Whelan, since his introduction, has been a part of the Hoods gang and the New Revengers, so he has definitely been in his fair share of crazy fights and done some terrible things, like the time he almost straight up murdered Spider-Man and would have succeeded if he wasn't interrupted. The reason I think he's too scary for the MCU to bring in is because he not only looks utterly terrifying, but thanks to his genetic alterations, his mental capabilities are at subhuman levels, meaning he pretty much works on primal instincts alone. I mean, sure, he's still able to talk, but his reasoning skills are not the best, so he's pretty ruthless. And let's not forget that he also likes to eat people. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1982's Captain America number 270, and let me know if you agree with me. Number 9. One Above All Residing in the lowest depths of the underworld known as the Below Place, the One Below All is the dark counterpart of the One Above All. It is the source of the mutagenic third form of gamma energy, which allows it to use gamma mutates to manifest itself whenever it feels it's necessary. The One Below All is actually what gave the Hulk his powers in the first place, as the Gamma Bomb test partially opened the green door that Below was kept behind. Fast forward through some really cool events that you should definitely check out for yourself, and we see the one below all possess the bodies of Brian Banner as the Devil Hulk, Walter Longkowski as Sasquatch, and the Absorbing Man, which led to the final battle of the Immortal Hulk arc. Revealing its true form, a giant green cloud of crazy gamma energy, the one below all torments the Hulk so much that Bruce Banner and the Hulk actually separate. However, Absorbing Man was able to reroute the gamma energy the demon was using it back into the Hulk's body, and with one powerful thunderclap, the one below all was stopped at at least this time anyways. One Below All is too terrifying for the MCU in my opinion because he's literally a god and the reason behind all the gamma radiation and the gamma power being such as the Hulk and Abomination, you know, etc. I mean, who knows? Honestly, if they want to send Mark Ruffalo off with a great story, they could finally give him his own movie trilogy and have this demon as his final battle. I highly doubt it though, so in the meantime, check out the One Below All in his first appearance in 2018's Immortal Hulk number 5. Number 8, Nightmare. This supervillain is basically the Freddy Krueger of the Marvel Universe, and if just knowing that isn't scary enough for you, then buckle up. Classified as a Class 3 demon able to capture a sleeping person's astral form, Nightmare's whole thing is he's able to bring their form into his realm to torture them, and the effects of that can last for hours, even after they wake up. Nightmare has been a major pain for many heroes in the Marvel Universe, including Peter Parker and the Hulk, and none more so than Doctor Strange. That Poor guy seems to get the biggest and baddest baddies out there, but I guess that's the price you pay when you're the most powerful sorcerer. Strange has made it clear that he makes a regular habit of casting a protection spell before he goes to sleep, so he does not have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this villain. Later in this character's run, we see Nightmare growing stronger by the minute, able to access human minds through the American dream alone, and he caused these people to go on a violent rampage until he was finally stopped by Captain America and S.H.I.E.L.D. Skip ahead a little bit more and we actually see the death of this character up against Loki, in which the trickster god used one of Iron Man's automated cars who just straight up flatten Nightmare. So, hey, at least we know he can be killed, right? What makes him so scary to me and definitely too scary for the MCU is he's literally the boogeyman. He's capable of wreaking havoc at any given time. His ability to terrorize the mind and attract his victims is in a never-ending horror makes him uniquely scary and I doubt lovable Disney would ever want to cause nightmares in their viewers. Now there is a new Doctor Strange coming out in 2022 though, so maybe we'll get to see this villain or maybe we'll get a mention of them. For now, check him out in his first appearance in 1963's Strange Tales number 10. Number 7, Shumagorath. Older than time itself, Shumagorath is essentially Marvel's take on a Lovecraftian eldritch horror. It is an unknown cosmic entity that used to run Earth before we pesky humans came along. So, as you can imagine, Shuma takes offense at this and often comes back to reclaim his old stomping ground. Doctor Strange is more often than not the only one who can actually fight this thing without completely losing his mind in the process, but as cosmic beings are known to do, it can never really be truly killed. It is considered to be the primal power of chaos and the greatest of the old ones, and aside from immeasurable strength, Shumagorath is also capable of creating powerful blasts of mystical energy that can literally wipe out planets. 
although its presence is usually unexpected and unwelcome. Doctor Strange did have to summon a small part of it once during Thanos' invasion of Manhattan to wreak havoc on the city and draw attention away from themselves. Outside of our own reality, Shumagorth has invaded many other Earths such as Earth 9411 and 9997. However, it is very rare that they come out on top because there is usually a Doctor Strange or a group of heroes there to put a stop to them. This terrifying villain is a bit too scary for the MCU in my opinion because well, I mean, just take a look at it. It is literally a massive eyeball and tentacles, just like a real Cthulhu vibe going on, and I'm not really a huge fan. We might end up seeing him in Multiverse of Madness, or even in whatever the third movie will be for Doctor Strange. A Lovecraftian Elder God would certainly be a badass final boss for Doctor Strange. Check out Shumagorth for yourself in 1973's Marvel premiere number 10, and let me know in the comments if you think an on-screen version could be on its way. Number 6. Demon Bear. I mean, from the name alone, you can probably guess why this one is scary, but just stay with me, okay? Created by a villain with a cursed knife, Demon Bear is a corrupted Apache bear spirit. He haunts the dreams of Daniel Moonstar of the New Mutants because he was actually made from her parents. In her nightmares, he tells her he killed her parents and that she's next. So, in a way, he's actually linked to her psionic abilities to create illusions, except his illusion is more of a demon. Like a regular old bear, Demon Bear has the vicious tendencies you would expect from a wild animal. However, there is a lot more than meets the eye. Drawing his powers from negative human emotions, Demon Bear can also teleport, transform, and corrupt human souls. He has gone up against other Marvel characters aside from the new mutants including Ghost Rider and Warpath, however, it was actually Psylocke who ultimately drove out the demon and saved the spirit bear within. He actually hangs out by her side as a companion now, so I guess he did get to redeem himself in some way. I think this character is way too scary for the MCU because he is literally an all-powerful bear that is capable of tormenting people. And not to mention he feeds off the negative emotions, so he only grows stronger the more the person doubts their abilities around him. That's just too much for one character, and I really can't see Marvel bringing him in anytime soon, so why not check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1983's New Mutants to tide yourself over until we finally get to see him in all his furry glory. Number 5. Gore the God Butcher Born on a planet with no name, Gore was taught from the very beginning to always trust the gods. However, they never seemed to answer his prayers. Stricken with grief after the loss of his parents, wife, and son, Gore completely gave up hope and renounced his faith from the gods. However, while wandering the desert, he actually encountered the god Null while he was engaged in battle with another god. With confirmation that the gods are real, Gore was needless to say pretty mad. And when the one god asked for help, Gore actually used a piece of Null's symbiote and created the all-black Necrosword to kill it. From then on, he vowed to take vengeance on all the gods for ignoring his prayers and thus began his journey as Gore the God Butcher. Wandering around the universe, Gore absorbs the power of every god he comes in contact with, torturing and killing along his warpath. That is until he finally meets the mighty Thor. The God Butcher storyline ranges across eons of time as Gore absorbs the ability to time travel and ends in an epic conclusion against three periods of Thor's life. Young Thor, Avengers Era Thor, and obviously Old King Thor. Now I doubt Gore will ever grace the screen in the MCU because he is just way too powerful. Equipped with the Necro Sword he carries around, he has the capability to literally slay anything that comes his way. If he was introduced much earlier on, he would have been a much bigger threat than Thanos. Also, you know, just a man who's lost his faith and has nothing to lose is definitely not someone you want to mess with. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 2013's Thor, God of Thunder, number two. Number 4, Annihilus. Known as the living death that walks or the lord of the negative zone, Annihilus is an insect-like creature with some truly insane power. He was exposed to an object called the Cosmic Control Rod, which extended his lifespan and gave him his powers. These powers include continuous rebirth, superhuman levels of strength, speed, durability, and stamina, and flight of course. Obsessed with protecting the rod, he did absolutely everything he could to keep it from everyone else until the Fantastic Four took it away from him. Annihilus has at various times been the ruler of the Negative Zone, controlling its inhabitants via his powerful Cosmic Control Rod. He first encountered the Fantastic Four after Reed Richards discovered how to travel to the Negative Zone from Earth. Over the years, he clashed with the Fantastic Four on many occasions, often with the group foiling his plan to invade Earth. He would later lead an enormous fleet of spaceships from the Negative Zone into the main universe, setting off the Annihilation Wave by destroying a ton of planets. The Armada was opposed by a number of cosmic heroes such as Star-Lord, Drax the Destroyer, and the Silver Surfer, and was thankfully stopped by the cosmic entity Galactus, with Nova killing Annihilus in the process. He was later reborn as an infant in the aftermath of the Annihilus storyline, but other than that we have seen Annihilus go up against the likes of many other heroes and he has been a worthy adversary to say the least. Now I doubt we'll see this character in the MCU anytime soon just due to their immense power and ability to literally broadcast intense fear into the others, the likes of which has even been able to shake the Hulk. It's
It's possible that we'll see them later on once more powerful characters such as Nova and Adam Warlock are introduced, but they are too big a threat. Give their story a read for yourself, starting with 1968's Fantastic Four Annual number 6. Number 3, The Maker. Now, unlike his Earth-616 counterpart, Reed Richards is about 20 years younger, born into a completely normal family, and, uh, God, what was it? Oh yeah, he's insane! Now, I'll try not to spoil too much of the story for you because I really think it deserves a read, but I will do my best to give you just the basics. Following an explosion that left Richards presumably dead, the Fantastic Four mourned his loss, but in reality, he's actually alive and well, and he actually set off the explosion himself and was responsible for a ton of other attacks around the city. Convinced that he knows how the world should be run from now on, he is willing to do whatever he thinks is right, regardless of the consequences. Thankfully, he is stopped by a group of heroes, and he is flung into the negative zone. But it didn't take him too long to get back, though, and he easily took over most of Europe. Fast forward a little bit, and we see him form the Dark Ultimates, but they were quickly defeated by the power of the Infinity Stones. Teaming up with Cabal of Earth-616, Richards was able to manipulate the Ultimates into prematurely attacking the Earth. And do I got you interested in the character? Good. I'll leave the rest of the story for you to read for yourself. What makes the Maker so terrifying is that he is so intelligent that there is really no way of defeating him. And since he has the ability to literally stretch his brain to make himself even smarter, he is always 10 steps ahead of you no matter what you do and what you think. Of course, we don't even have the regular Mr. Fantastic in the MCU yet, so even if they have been considering integrating this character, this character's introduction is definitely far off. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with 2004's Ultimate Fantastic Four, number one, or feel free to just skip ahead to when he is the maker by taking a look at 2011's Ultimate Comics, Ultimates, number one. Number two, The Skinless Man. If you were ever wondering why they called Wolverine Weapon X, well, Here's your answer. It's not an X, it's actually the Roman numeral for 10. Now with that in mind, meet weapon number 3, the Skinless Man. Harry Pyre used to be a barrister during the Cold War, and he was actually very good at his job thanks to his mutant power, elastic and multi-sensory skin. Designated weapon 3 by the Weapons Plus program that augmented his strength and powers, Pyre went on to do some pretty terrible things, and all of that finally caught up to him when Phantom X shot him, stole his skin, and left him for dead. Now with no skin, Pizer took revenge on Phantom X by cutting off his face and was later recruited into the new Brotherhood of Evil Mutants while he was on the run from that. Once again though, everything seems to catch up to him because in 2013's Uncanny X-Force number 34, he meets an untimely end and he's not really been seen since. I could go into all the other horrific stuff this guy has done in the comics appearances, but do I really need to? It should be plainly obvious that there will never be an MCU version of the skinless man out there. He has no skin, and his whole thing is literally putting you in a similar predicament as him. That just seems to me like you've got a formula for a character that will forever be stuck in the pages of a comic book. I also understand that he is prominent in the X-Men universe, which is not necessarily the MCU, but it's fine. I'm definitely not far off when I say that there is no way they would use his character, even if they had the rights to him. Check out his story for yourself in his first full appearance in 2012's Uncanny X-Force number 21. And finally, number one, we have Arcade. Nobody really knows who or what Arcade was before his life of crime. He has given so many different accounts over the years with no evidence to prove any of them. The one that seems the most true is that he killed his father when he was 21 in order to acquire massive amounts of money, and he discovered that he really liked killing, so he became an assassin. However, he soon got really bored with that and decided to use his wealth to construct a death-themed amusement park to kill people. As a skilled killer, Arcade has been tasked with killing many heroes over the years such as Spider-Man, Ghost Rider, and many X-Men as well. But all of his attempts have ended in failure. On his 29th birthday, he learned that he was a huge laughing stock in the villain community, and this made him realize that what he'd been doing is no longer a game, and that winning from this point on is everything. Using his genius level intellect and his vast fortune, he constructed a new murder land and trapped 16 teen heroes in it for a month, toying with them and prodding them. However, they were eventually freed, and Arcade was last seen tied to the front of the shield helicarrier as a form of torture for everything that he had done. What makes him terrifying to me is that he's all about mind games and toying with people, which basically makes him the Marvel equivalent of Saw. He knows exactly what to do and say to get people to gang up against each other, and he has the knowledge and resources to execute any plan. That is way too much power for one villain to have, especially a movie villain, so I feel like we won't get to see this character on the big screen anytime soon. Maybe one day though, who knows? Number 10, Court of Owls. The Court of Owls is a villainous and powerful group who seek to exert and wield political influence in order to shape the world as they choose. They are enemies of Batman and often use their group of highly skilled assassins known as Talons to eliminate those who stand in their way. These assassins are also immortal to an extent, as they are often imbued with a metallic alloy known as Electrum, which has astounding healing properties and can even reanimate and resurrect dead tissue. The Court of Owls was created by Greg Capullo and Scott Snyder. 
Snyder, first appearing as adversaries to Bruce Wayne in the 2011 Batman series in issue number 2. Number 9. Granny Goodness. Her name might not make her sound terrifying, but Granny Goodness is not as sweet as her name makes her out to be. She became a trainer of Darkseid's soldiers after impressing him when she herself was selected to train and become one of his elite hounds. Fans of Kingsman may find the story of how she was trained very familiar. During her training regimen, she was given a dog to train herself, who stayed with her and progressed alongside her. After bonding with the animal whom she named Mercy, she was later instructed to kill it. Goodness refused and instead killed her trainer. When Darkseid asked her why she had done this, she revealed that Mercy was worth more than her trainer had been to Darkseid, as Goodness had trained the dog to not only be loyal to her, but to Darkseid above her. Darkseid tested the theory by ordering Mercy to kill Goodness and was impressed when he found the dog actually obeyed. Goodness, of course, was forced to kill Mercy, but this act would inspire Darkseid to shape and use Granny Goodness as his most reliable trainer and recruiter of soldiers, with Goodness being responsible for brainwashing those she trained and becoming the most loyal and fearless members of Dark Side's army. Number 8. Black Flash In the comics, Black Flash acts as a symbol of death, and also sometimes as literal death for the speedsters. You see, the former Flashes and past speedsters have all been too fast for regular death to touch them, and so it seems instead they have their own version. Enter the Black Flash. The Black Flash draws power from the speed force like many of the other speedsters we've seen. This being is able to freeze time, but only for those who do not possess potent super speed powers. It resembles death in appearance, looking like a corpse of a zombified version of the Flash. While Black Flash has appeared in the Arrowverse, this Speed Force entity has yet to appear in the DCEU. Number 7. Mandrak the Dark Monitor Mandrak is a pretty confusing entity, but also a fairly scary one. Mandrak was once, or is, depending on what you believe, Dax Novu. And Dax Novu was once part of the Monitor. Following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, the injuries the Monitor had suffered caused it to splinter somewhat, dividing its body and creating other, smaller Monitors. Dax Novu was one of these Monitors. He eventually realized that the Monitors were parasitic beings who were feeding on the energies of the multiverse, slowly consuming and destroying it. He informed the other monitors of this, but was shunned for attempting to share his realization. Dax then became corrupted, turning into a dark monitor known as Mandrak. While we might eventually see the monitor and anti monitor make their way into the DCEU films, it's unlikely we'll see this dark monitor pop up anytime soon. Number 6. Anti Monitor. Speaking of monitors, we should also quickly touch on another scary and powerful one, sort of the scary and powerful one, the Anti Monitor. Anti Monitor is a supremely powerful villain who threatened the very existence of the multiverse during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. He controlled the antimatter universe and is hell bent on ensuring the destruction of all things. So much so that even after Anti Monitor is defeated, Necron ended up trapping the Anti Monitor's body and, as it was later revealed in Blackest Night, using it as a source of power for the Black Central Power Battery. While we might get a sort of crisis inspired storyline in the DCEU with all different alternate universes and timelines from DC in television and film being acknowledged, it's more likely that they'll go the Flashpoint route as opposed to the Crisis on Infinite Earths route. Number 5. Dr. Death The most recent incarnation of Dr. Death from Prime Earth was only around for 5 issues. So it's not just his horrific story and appearance that will likely bar him from appearing in the DCEU. It's also just that he isn't really one of the main villains. He doesn't have as much clout. However, in the few issues we did see him in, he proved to be a terrifying villain and foe. Dr. Carl Helfern was a brilliant scientist working for Wayne Enterprises on a serum that would strengthen bones, causing them to become more durable instead of breaking when under stress. However, his failed attempts combined with other mental trauma and strain caused him to go in Insane. He killed his scientific team, injecting them with a failed version of the serum that caused their bones to grow until they were ripped apart. Number 4. The Corinthian The Corinthian isn't specifically from DC directly itself, but is from an imprint of theirs that used to be known as Vertigo. Well, it's still known as Vertigo, but it no longer exists. It was discontinued and instead, we got Black Label, which is also an amazing line, but everyone was obviously still sad to see Vertigo go. One of Vertigo's most famous series was Sandman, which also featured some of DC's characters who made cameos throughout. The Corinthian, however, was not one of these, but is a character unique to the world of Sandman. While we are getting a Netflix series for Sandman in 
in 2021. I also think it would be super cool to get some darker toned DC films. Among them, it would be cool to get some Sandman or at least a Sandman film. Although the Corinthian might be too monstrous to actually make an appearance, even if we did get a Sandman film. He is one of the nightmares that Dream made. At one point, he escapes the dreaming and ventures out in the world, where he becomes a serial killer who pulls out and eats his victim's eyes. He himself has mouths where his eyes should be and usually wears sunglasses to disguise his monstrous appearance. Ugh, eating eyes. It allows him to see everything that you've seen, which is, uh, gross still. No, it's still gross. Number three, Dr. Destiny. Speaking of Sandman, I want to talk in particular about another horrific villain who appeared there. Although this one also exists as a horror and supervillain within the direct DC Comics universe as well. There he wielded a device he'd invented called the Materiopticon. This device was later retconned to be Morpheus' dreamstone, which his mother gave him, when Dr. D appeared in Sandman. Dr. Destiny was hypnotized by the Justice League to prevent him from dreaming and becoming too powerful. As a result, he was driven insane and ended up in Arkham Asylum, wasting away, becoming a skeletal version of himself. When he escaped, he wreaked havoc at an all night 24 hours diner where he tortured the patrons and staff before Dream finally caught up with him. Thank goodness, cause that issue, woo, it's crazy. Number two, Professor Pig. Professor Pig's real name is Laszlo Valentin. He is a former spiral agent who went insane and became obsessed with curing people of their individualism in order to perfect them. When the crime syndicate temporarily took over Earth, Gotham City was overtaken by the criminals who ruled in Batman's absence. Pig himself used the hospital as his own HQ and worked from there, kidnapping civilians, sedating them, and transforming them with strange cosmetic and mutilating procedures, using involuntary patients to create his own horrific Dolatron army. He was created by Grant Morrison and Andy Kubert and also first appeared in 2011's Batman series. Number 1. Jane Doe Jane Doe is a serial killer who served time at Arkham Asylum. She appears to not have any skin of her own, appearing to be covered in exposed muscle tissue. Instead, she covets the skin and lives of others. While she doesn't appear to have any specific superpowers, it has been implied that she might be possible of shapeshifting. She often gets to know her victims before killing them and adopting their identities, sometimes even wearing their preserved skin as a suit, instead of simply using makeup to disguise herself. For example, I could be Jane Doe right now and you wouldn't even know. That's how good she is at it. Oh my goodness. Number 10, Sticks. Starting off the list today with a pretty terrifying mutant. Jacob Akron was once a homeless man who was approached on the street by a medical researcher to participate in an experiment involving some new pharmaceuticals, and he obviously accepted because the pay was good and there were very few risks. It was revealed that during the trial, the researcher had actually lied about what he was looking into. The trial was about exploring whether the human body could develop an immunity to cancer, so Jacob was injected with a mutated cancer compound. Alongside developing an immunity to the disease, he also became a living cancer cell with the ability to kill organic matter just by touching it. However, his mind was also tainted and he took up the name Styx after the river Styx. Jacob quickly developed an affinity for death, finding it was the only thing that could bring him happiness, and alongside Gerald Stone, the two made a deadly mercenary duo. Now I highly doubt that Marvel will ever consider bringing this baddie into the MCU because his origins are way too dark for good old Disney, plus he is a ruthless killer who does it for nothing more than just pleasure. So for now, check him out in comic book form in his first appearance in 1988's Amazing Spider-Man number 309. Number 9, Bullseye. Known as the Mercenary of Mystery, Lester, insert name last year, might not have any powers, but that by no means makes him any less terrifying. Lester has always been a master marksman, and before his mercenary career, he tried his hand at Major League Baseball, but quickly grew bored with it because he was constantly pitching perfect games. However, he quickly found his true calling as a special operative of the United States National Security Agency. Not long after, he became a freelance merc because he found too much joy in killing his targets with his signature killing method throwing things. Getting a reputation in New York City, Bullseye was hired to take down Matt Murdock, but ultimately failed every time as he was stopped by, you know, Daredevil. Later on, we see him go up against the likes of the Punisher and Spider-Man and walk away to tell the tale, which is quite the feat for someone with no powers. The worst thing this villain ever did, in my opinion at least, was kill not one, but two of Daredevil's girlfriends, Elektra and Karen Page. This led to his demise at the hands of Daredevil, of course, because I can't imagine anyone who wouldn't want revenge after that. I doubt we'll ever see Bullseye in the MCU because one, we already have a master marksman in the form of Hawkeye, and Two, his methods of torture and his sadistic nature are utterly terrifying and putting that on the big screen would be too much in my opinion. Check out this character for yourself and let me know what you think, starting with his first appearance in 1976's Daredevil number 131.
Number 8, Blackheart. A slightly lesser known villain and utterly terrifying son of the demon Mephisto. Usually depicted as an enemy of Ghost Rider, this all-powerful demon is one of the most powerful in the Marvel Universe and possesses a vast array of magical powers including telekinesis, telepathy, the ability to travel dimensions, and of course, the ability to project energy blasts out of his hands. Under his father's tutelage, Blackheart explored and learned everything about being evil in nature and has attempted to corrupt many of our favorite heroes such as Ghost Rider, Spider-Man, and Wolverine. Blackheart is the leader of the Spirits of Vengeance, a group that was created to oppose the Ghost Rider and with their help he caused some serious damage in the Marvel Universe. Skip ahead a bit and we see Blackheart with some newly acquired demonic powers attempting to take over the Earth by himself. Thankfully this was stopped by the Avengers and Spider-Man, but not before he could rip out the Falcon's soul and send it to hell. I feel Blackheart is way too scary for the MCU because not only is he the son of Mephisto, a demon so powerful we've only ever heard of him in the MCU, he is the embodiment of evil itself with so many powers making him a ginormous threat. Imagine him getting introduced alongside Mephisto, I mean any fight against the two would be over in the blink of an eye. Give Blackheart's origin a read for yourself starting with 1989's Daredevil number 270 and let me know if you think he could ever make it on the big screen one day in the comments below. Number 7, Galactus. Another villain that has been off limits to the MCU for quite some time thanks to his ties to the Fantastic Four, which has made so many fans around the world fear they would never see him on the big screen. Galactus is the sole survivor of the sixth incarnation of the multiverse. Originally, Galactus was a humanoid named Galan, born in the previous incarnation of Earth-616 on the planet Ta, a paradise-like world whose civilization is said to have been the most advanced of any known universes at the time. However, the Six Infinity and all its universes were in their final stages of collapse due to the multiversal renewal cycle, being consumed by the abstract entity known as the Black Winter. Fast forward a bit to him becoming a cosmic entity. Galactus possesses almost limitless cosmic power that gives him a vast array of powers that would take me forever to list off for you guys, it is actually ridiculous. With his insatiable hunger for energy and his heralds of Galactus by his side, the almighty being is an almost unstoppable force capable of pretty much anything. Like seriously, he's not called the devourer of worlds and the god of oblivion for nothing. Do I really need to explain why Galactus probably won't appear in the MCU, I mean at least anytime soon? The dude eats planets, and as it stands right now, there aren't many heroes in the MCU that can help take down such a big threat. It would be super cool and I would honestly freak if I ever saw him in a movie one day, but it is so unlikely right now just due to his sheer power and presence. Check out Galactus for yourself in his first appearance in 1966's Fantastic Four number 48. Number 6, Mojo. Just looking at this guy gives me shivers up and down my spine. Mojo is a part of an alien race from a planet known as Mojo World that resides in a pocket dimension known as the Mojoverse. He is a powerful sorcerer whose full power is unknown and outside of his home world of Mojo World, Mojo possesses the ability to create an anti-life energy field that kills any natural organism, he can project concussive blasts, and he can even increase his own power through television ratings. Mojo has been seen manipulating so many characters in the Marvel comics, including Rachel Summers, who he got to work for him for a while, but once she broke free he took matters into his own hands and decided to create his own versions of the X-Men to serve under him, and thus the X-Babies were born. Fast forward past a ton of attempts to get his ratings up so he could increase his power, we see a desperate Mojo launch an all-out attack on New York City that separated the X-Men and sent them into intricate recreations of key periods in their lives. Now I doubt Mojo will make it to the big screen anytime soon because, well, I mean, look at him, I can only imagine how grotesque he would look, but also because of his methods. Mojo is so self-absorbed and wants nothing more than to be powerful and liked, which for him kind of go hand in hand. So he'll do anything and everything and get rid of anyone who stands in his way. Check out Mojo for yourself starting with his first appearance in 1985's Long Shot number 3 and see if you agree with why I doubt we'll ever see him in the MCU. Number 5, Dracula. A lot of you are probably looking at your screen right now like Jack. Are you sure you know what you're talking about? Dracula has played a pretty decent role in a lot of Batman stories, but this is Marvel. Well, you might be surprised to find out that Dracula has been a pretty prominent figure in the Marvel Universe for quite some time. Like most iterations, Vlad Dracula is the supreme ruler and the world's most powerful vampire. Driven by lust for power, companionship, and blood, his centuries of undead existence have brought him into a conflict with vampire hunters, other immortals, and, more recently, superpowered heroes. Born in 1430, Dracula didn't become the vampiric overlord until 1459, after he was beaten in battle by the Turkish warlord Tarak, and was taken to Egypt to be healed. However, it was revealed that he actually turned into a vampire. With newfound vampire powers such as superhuman strength, speed and agility, a regenerative healing factor, hypnotism and weather manipulation, Dracula wreaked havoc for centuries with few that could oppose him. 
Fast forward many, many years to modern times, and we see Dracula go up against the likes of Blade, Johnny Storm, Mephisto, Thor, and even try twice to make Storm a vampire so she could become his bride. I can't imagine that Disney will ever give the green light for this character because a blood-sucking, all-powerful vampiric villain doesn't really fit with Disney's style. Not to mention that they don't really like to make R-rated movies, and that is the only way this character would work. Appearing for the first time all the way back in 1951, Suspense number 7, why not familiarize yourself with Dracula just a bit more? Number 4, Shadow King. Had to include the Shadow King on this list because he wasn't on the last one and he is too good, or I, I guess bad, to leave out. He is allegedly a multiversal manifestation of the dark side of the human consciousness that came to be after the first ever nightmare. Operating through Amal Farouk, who acts as his human vessel, the Shadow King is stated to be a true Omega telepath, making him the most powerful telepath on Earth besides Charles Xavier, as he has been shown to overtake some of the most strong-willed characters like Black Panther and Gentle without them even being aware of it. Shadow King was actually the one responsible for the Psy War, when he tricked Psylocke into causing a massive wave of energy that destructed psionic powers across the world. However, he ended up stretching himself a little bit too thin, attempting to link with all the minds on Earth, and was defeated by Psylocke in her new shadow astral form. This wasn't actually the end for him though, as he was around well after Charles Xavier's death, he even possessed his body for a while. Shadow King has appeared over many Earths in the Marvel Universe, taking a different evil form each time, such as on Earth 6141, where he merged with Professor X, becoming Shadow X, or on Earth 1298, where he also took over Charles Xavier and became Onslaught. I can't imagine Marvel ever putting the Shadow King on the big screen because he is far too big a threat. It seems impossible to actually get rid of him without another being whose powers are on par with him, which is actually what happened in the comics when Professor X and Psylocke teamed up. Check out this multi-universal being for yourself, starting with their first appearance in 1979's X-Men number 117. Number 3, The Brood. The insect-like alien race that travels through space with the goal of finding hosts to infest with their spawn. Yuck. Brood societies work similar to how an average bug colony works, with them living in clans or swarms that serve under the Empress Brood. They are a truly savage race that not only enjoy the suffering that they cause others, they also revel in the terror that their infections cause their hosts. They don't technically have any powers, but they are incredibly resistant thanks to their exoskeletons, they have tentacles that are capable of long-range attacks, and they use their razor-sharp teeth and stingers in, in close combat to deliver either paralyzing or fatal poison. The Brood have been seen on Earth many times throughout Marvel history, going up against the likes of Carol Danvers, Wolverine, Fang, and a large number of the X-Men as well. Sometime after their initial appearance on Earth, a mixed team of X-Men and the Fantastic Four discovered that the Brood Queen and her squadron were leading an attack on Earth, with the first of the bunch arriving in New York City, but thankfully they were stopped rather quickly thanks to a cerebro-enhanced Emma Frost. They have been seen around since, but I'll let you discover what happened for yourself. Now I really can't see Marvel bringing this alien race to the MCU as they are anytime soon. Maybe if they weren't partnered with Disney they would be willing, but I can't imagine their parent company would be cool with a bunch of malicious insect-like creatures getting people pregnant predator style. Check out the Brood's first appearance for yourself in 1982's X-Men number 155. Number 2, Demogoblin. Jason McIndale Jr. had had enough of losing against Spider-Man and the Green Goblins, so in their quest for the power that he craved, he ended up following a bunch of demons back to their lair to confront their Dark Lord. Impressed with his efforts and will, the Demon Lord bestowed upon him superhuman abilities through a demonic possession. However, the demon proved to be incompatible and ended up ripping away from his human host and began living separately as the Demo Goblin. Determined to destroy all sinners and redeem himself, the Demo Goblin went up against the likes of Spider-Man, Ghost Rider, Venom, and even Jacob McIndale Jr. because they were the only ones willing to stand in his way. After the Demo Goblin's initial death from a church pillar crushing him, he was resurrected by Carnage using Shriek's body as a new vessel and dubbed himself the Demo Goblin now. Alongside her new BF Carnage, she traveled around with Man-Wolf to hunt down Misty Knight and she would have killed Misty Knight if it weren't for Man-Wolf intervening. In a more recent storyline that takes place after Dark Carnage's death, Demogoblin started calling herself Saint D and basically started her own religion. Considering that Carnage is too scary for the MCU to bring in and that they play such a large role in the Demogoblin story, it makes sense that this character wouldn't be introduced anytime soon. Not to mention that they are totally fine with killing and do whatever they think is necessary. Take a look at this terrifying creature for yourself in their first appearance as the Hobgoblin in 1989's The Spectacular Spider-Man number 147, or feel free to skip ahead to their time as the Demogoblin in 2019's Absolute Carnage Lethal Protectors number 1. Number 1, Null the Symbiote God. Once an ancient malevolent deity whose existence predates the universe itself, and was originally content to just drift through the endless abyss that existed before time itself. When the Celestials started creating the universe, Null was awakened by the light of creation and was pretty pissed because his kingdom of darkness was pretty much ruined. 
After killing one of the Celestials, he was cast back into the Void once again, and then he created a symbiotic suit of armor out of the darkness he commanded, and started his journey across the universe with the goal of getting rid of the other gods for good. The only weakness that Null has is against the Light, which refers to the various powers that are wielded by the cosmic entities. Null is the one responsible for the creation of the symbiotes that we're all familiar with, you know, the ones that make up Venom and Carnage. He's the reason we have two of the most terrifying villains in the Marvel Universe, and that alone makes me want to go nowhere near him. Not to mention, he's the one who gave Gore the God Butcher All Black the Necrosword. Historically, we've seen Null go up against Silver Surfer and so many gods coming out on top every time, and then in modern times, we have seen him go up against symbiote users like Venom and Spider-Man. I can't imagine we'll get to see Null in the MCU for a couple of reasons. The biggest being that Venom isn't in the MCU, but that's not my whole argument, don't worry. Null is a literal god capable of pretty much anything that he sets his mind to, and he is powerful enough to create symbiotes and beings that can overpower any of the heroes that we've seen both on and off of the big screen. He's too much of a threat right now, but that doesn't mean that I'm not hoping he'll show up one day. Trust me, I really want him to be there. For now, read all about the symbiote god for yourself, starting with their first appearance in 2018's Venom Volume 4, number 3. And at 10, Earth X. We already know that Ultron is a powerful villain, and the fact that he can basically infinitely resurrect himself because, you know, he's a robot is already damn horrifying. Now, imagine the Absorbing Man, who uses his absorption abilities to become Ultron, taking the intelligence and processing power of an AI hellbent on destruction, and then using it to become the Avengers' ultimate foe. Well, that's what happened to Ultron on Earth X, also known as Earth 9997. Absorbing Man claimed Ultron's powers, which I wouldn't even think was possible since he doesn't have powers and is instead a robot with AI, but he does it and somehow also gains his processing power, which is already terrifying for a robot, but like, a human with that kind of functionality is absolutely monstrous, but nothing compared to what's coming. In at 9, Earth 1071. On Earth 1071, this version of Ultron isn't known as Ultron 9 or anything like that. Instead, this version is simply Ultron, because at this point he's risen to the peak of his powers and subjugated the human race, which obviously fought back, but after destroying all of the human resistance, Ultron reigns supreme over the Earth, because of course he did. He was confronted by Kang the Conqueror though, who relished in the challenge of confronting the most powerful Ultron in recorded history. But Kang failed to defeat Ultron, and returned time and time again with new allies to overwhelm the robot overlord. Kang's repeated abuse of the time stream actually ended up causing it to fracture altogether, threatening reality as we know it. A version of Ultron who can beat up Kang the Conqueror multiple times, even when he brings allies? Dude, that's nothing to mess with. Like, that's the, one of the most terrifying concepts I've heard. And not to mention what this guy looks like. He's an absolute beast. This man does not miss out on the gains. He has spikes going across every appendage on his body. It's f***ing nuts. And it ate Ultron 1320. Ultron 1320 comes from Earth 14622 and What If Age of Ultron number one. An Earth where, thanks to the Wasp dying, Ultron is able to take over the world even faster. Ultron was created to be the ultimate AI by Hank Pym to help the Avengers utilize their function better as a team. But with the untimely death of Pym's wife, Pym went on to create a more brutal version of Ultron, which was to replace the Avengers. But with this, Ultron's sentience began to constantly evolve. He started the eradication of the human race early by taking out such threats as the Avengers and the Defenders while he left Pym alive so that he would have to watch and suffer. Ultron and his army of Ultron Sentinels then moved to Kola, Russia so he could bore himself into the planet's core to create the ultimate version of himself, Ultron 1320. Ultron then has his minions batter and beat Pym unconscious until he wakes up just to find himself as he's been turned into Ultron 1321. Great. This version also invaded other worlds, claiming Earths 62412, 23223, and 81223, but was stopped on Earth 45162. Thank God. And it's 7, Lord Ultron. Upon first being constructed, Ultron 1 destroyed his creator, Henry Pym. After the death of the Avengers, though, Ultron was able to destroy the remaining superheroes and bring about his rule. When Doctor Doom created his battle world, Earth 21261 became perfection with Ultron as its rule. 
Ruler, appearing in Age of Ultron vs Marvel Zombies number 1 from 2015. After spending time on Battleworld in constant battle with the zombies of the Deadlands, Ultron determined that the best way to take over Battleworld and defeat his creations was to form an alliance with the zombies and was able to reach an agreement with Magneto, which resulted in Ultron successfully merging undead flesh and technology and made a whole army of undead drone versions of himself and launched an attack on Salvation, a refuge founded by Wonder Man, Human Torch, and Vision, who Ultron had actually created himself. Bro, I don't want to deal with either zombies or Ultron, but having to deal with both of them? No thank you. And it's 6, MCU. The MCU Ultron is probably the most popular or most well known version there is, just based on how many people watch the movies over reading the comics. However, the MCU Ultron is still pretty damn scary. Being probably the most effective enemy in the entire MCU, based on how his actions affected the world of the MCU permanently. Without Ultron, there would have been no Civil War, no Sokovia Accords, Zemo wouldn't have lost his family, resulting in him not being able to help in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Hell, even Thanos would have lost since the Russo brothers went on record to say that the reason the Avengers lost in Infinity War was because Iron Man and Cap weren't fighting together, which was caused thanks to the actions of Ultron. So I guess you could also say that there would be no Ultron without Thanos, but Ultron could have been created in another way. Ultron wasn't reliant on Thanos, but a load of other things were reliant on Ultron, which makes him the most successful villain in the MCU. Halfway through into number 5, Ultron 8. Ultron 8 was debuted in Avengers Volume 1 number 162 from 1977, and it also started a, a very um, Frankenstein-esque robot love story known as the Bride of Ultron Saga. Ultron 8 created a mate named Jocasta, and in order to create a more advanced AI to give to this robot and give it, you know, sentience, Ultron brainwashed his own maker into transferring the mind of his wife, Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp, into Jocasta's shell. The Wasp in Jocasta's body alerted her teammates, you know, the Avengers, who then defeated Ultron and reversed the process, leaving just the robot a mindless husk. Ultron, though, was later able to revive Jocasta with a remote link, activating the mental uh, residue that was left behind by the Wasp. But this time, she was programmed to be loyal to Ultron, but eventually betrayed him, choosing to help the Avengers defeat him instead. That sucks, dude, trust me. I know what it's like to have someone you love, and you thought loved you back, totally screw you, but uh, I mean, they didn't really defeat me, they just beat me down emotionally. Afterwards, Jocasta adventured with the Avengers for a brief time, but never really felt accepted, and then left them before she, unbeknownst to her, was about to be made an official member. So, uh, rip. In it for Gold Ultron. Years ago, Hank Pym was approached by the Wolverine of an alternate universe, where Ultron had launched a massive and sudden attack on New York City and the rest of the world, quickly taking over the whole planet and annihilating humankind. And this Wolverine wanted to kill Pym in order to prevent this future from happening. This dystopian future follows the footsteps of stories like Age of Apocalypse, since this is Age of Ultron, after all. However, this killing of Hank Pym created a timeline where Earth was constantly being threatened by Morgana Le Fay, and the heroes were struggling to survive. Survive. So, Pym was allowed to live, but he was tasked to create a hidden failsafe program to destroy Ultron if they ever ended up needing it. Which is good because, in the present day, a strange object crashes onto Earth, which turns out to be Ultron, who had returned. Because, you know, of course he f***ing did. Being defeated by this failsafe program once and for all though, or so they thought. This is also in the uh, main Earth 616 continuity, but there's also the Earth 6112 Earth where Ultron actually wins. And that's the separate Age of Ultron thing. The, uh, there's, so, there's enough Age of Ultrons where it kind of gets confusing. Getting close to the end and in number 3, Ultron Phalanx. At the end of the Ultron initiative storyline, Ares used a computer virus to wipe Ultron's programming from a set of Iron Man armor that had Tony inside. And they thought that this was the end of it. However, this was not the end of Ultron, for his disembodied consciousness was drawn to a babble spire on a world conquered by the phalanx. Instead of being assimilated though, Ultron took control of the phalanx through sheer force of will, bending them to his dominion. In turn, they viewed Ultron as the sympathetic father that they had begged for, so Ultron became the ruler of the phalanx. Yeah, the homicidal sadistic killing machine robot thing was transformed into the ruler of a techno-organic species of alien. That's nothing to be concerned about in the slightest, right? Why would we ever need to be worried? about that.
Mm -hmm. That doesn't really seem like a terrifying and universe ending combination. Well, actually it wasn't since Ultron was able to be defeated eventually, but that has got to be the scariest version of Ultron from Earth 616, hands down. But ultimately in the number two, all father Ultron. In the year 2040 on Earth 14831, a new strain of Ultron appeared, the ultimate Ultron. He easily destroyed the Avengers, ruthlessly crushed any resistance, and built factories supplying endless drones to expand his empire. He also enslaved most of humanity and then created his own AI Avengers, successfully extending his reach to the entirety of the solar system. And at some point he had also imprisoned all of Asgardians with the help of Loki and then had taken the power of Odin for himself. So in turn, this guy has all the powers of Ultron in addition to all the powers of Odin. It took three Thors, one with two hammers, two Mjolnirs to take him down. And they couldn't even kill him, they just had to like banish him from the world. They had to like straight up Alduin Elder or scroll this guy out of existence, but probably only sent him forward in time instead. This guy is an absolute beast. Finally, and at number one, Ultron 1. This is probably the most insanely overpowered version of Ultron we've seen so far, and it's coming from the MCU no less. Oh, and uh, spoiler alert for those of you who aren't cut up on the Disney Plus What If series. The history of Earth TRN 906 was the same as the MCU, until Ultron was able to secure what would have been Vision's body for himself. Ultron managed to download his consciousness into the synthetic body that he had created, thus killing the Avengers and decimating life on Earth. After killing Thanos and taking the Infinity Stones for himself, Ultron remakes the universe in his image. He decimated the Earth, absolutely wrecking everyone in it, even killing Captain Marvel, Hulk, Thor, and eventually discovering the Watcher and the multiverse. This version of Ultron literally sliced Thanos in half with the Mind Stone. He comes out of the portal like he does in the movies, like... <laughs> And then <laughs> Ultron's just like, interesting, Zip. and he just, he falls, he falls in half. Which reveals the biggest mistake that the MCU made was destroying the Mind Stone in Infinity War. But after gaining all the Infinity Stones, he goes shot for shot with the Watcher, a literal cosmic entity that realistically shouldn't really have a true corporeal form. Holy damn, this is overpowered to the Max. I know I'm swearing a lot, but watch this episode. This man is sending the Watcher through realities. It's like grabbing him and flying him through walls, but the walls are dimensions. Number 10, Doomsday. I have to just assume that Batman is afraid of Doomsday. And there are multiple reasons I believe this. For starters, anytime I've seen Batman even attempt to get involved in a fight with Doomsday, he is never throwing punches. He is either staying the heck out of the way, maybe only acting as a distraction, or he is powered up by some serious magical artifacts. Secondly, Batman is incredibly smart. He knows how hard it is for someone to take down Superman. And the fact that Doomsday is one of the few characters who was able to do it, and with such brutality, there is no way Batman is not intimidated by this monster. I refuse to believe it. Honestly, my favorite point of proof is seeing what Ben Affleck's Batman does in Batman vs Superman. Say what you want about that movie, but Batman jumping around the battlefield just trying his best to stay out of the way? Hilarious. Number 9, Prometheus. As a dramatic inversion of Batman, the tragic figure of Prometheus presents a serious threat to the Dark Knight. Enraged by the passing away of his parents at the hands of law enforcement, Prometheus vows to fight the law with the same intent that Batman seeks to uphold it. Backed by ludicrous sums of money, Prometheus trains diligently and becomes the bane of police officers and military men across America. Armed with an all-powerful helmet, Prometheus earns godlike powers that give him the strength of the best fighters on Earth. It's no wonder that when he breaks into the Justice League Watchtower, he single-handedly beats the majority of the team, and Batman takes the majority of that shellacking. Prometheus runs the Dark Knight into the ground. It was the first showdown between the two orphans and Prometheus takes the victory without like any effort at all. Hey, are you liking this video? Well, then hit that thumbs up button, rookie. We need your support. Number eight, Zaz. Victor Zaz has a character trait that a few others on this list possess. He's just completely and utterly insane. Zaz scares Batman for one main reason. Whenever he is not locked up, it's almost guaranteed that lives will come to an end, which just ups the ante because every escape of this killer becomes a race against the clock for Batman. He needs to bring him down 
fast before he adds another scar to his body. Every single one of those scars signifies a failure for Batman. Zaz is a man with absolutely no form of pity or morals, and he will never stop unless he passes away, but we know Batman will never do that. In an alternate story, Injustice, Zaz is even responsible for the passing of Alfred Pennyworth, which was not supposed to happen, but because Zaz is Zaz, it did. Number 7. Thomas Wayne Batman Other versions of Batman always have the potential to be a scary thought for our Batman, or anyone really. But when that version of Batman is Bruce Wayne's own father, who completely destroys him emotionally, teams up with Bane, and is trying to stop Batman being Batman so he can have a normal life, it's an incredibly interesting idea for a character, honestly. But with all the daddy issues Batman has, for his alternate reality father to be so twisted and brutal has got to be a terrifying thought. But what did Thomas do that was so bad? Well, let me tell you. Alongside Bane, he ruined Batman and Catwoman's wedding, causing her to leave him at the altar, nearly had Batman send Mr. Freeze to the afterlife for a crime he did not commit, kidnapped Damian Wayne, hired the KG Beast to take out Dick Grayson, he had Bane put Alfred Pennyworth in the ground, then Thomas incapacitated Bruce with fear toxin and kidnapped him. He dug up the coffin of Martha Wayne, wishing to use the Lazarus Pit to resurrect Martha so that they could all be a happy family again. He went more than a little overboard is what I'm saying. Number Number 6. The Batman Who Laughs Another version of Batman, only this time it's basically the ultimate evil version of himself, a jokerized Bruce Wayne. He is just absolutely awful. He has all the smarts and skill of Batman himself, but the completely bonkers unpredictability of Joker. And this combo causes the Batman Who Laughs to become one of the biggest threats to the entire multiverse. Now. Being a Jokerized Bruce Wayne, he has a few differences to the man himself. He's thinner and faster, but physically weaker. Unfortunately, physicality in battle with this guy doesn't really matter. He's got backup in the form of his Dark Knights, and he has backup plans on top of backup plans as any Batman worth his salt would have. This guy put his consciousness into a Batman with the power of Dr. Manhattan and destroyed Perpetua, the first creator of the multiverse and the mother of the Monitor, Anti-Monitor, and the World Forger. Number 5. Pig Professor Pig is a villain that came to be during a time when Batman stories were becoming incredibly dark. And Pig himself has to be one of the darkest villains of that era. His methods completely disgust the Dark Knight. He looks like a character straight out of a horror or slasher movie, and his obsession with physical perfection, like in the myth of Pygmalion, became part of the reason he surgically mutilates his victims, turning them into his mind-controlled servants called Dolotrons. If his crimes weren't horrifying enough, then just look at him. Yeah. Get out of my nightmares. Thank you. Bye. Number 4. Scarecrow With Scarecrow, fear is the name of the game. I don't believe Batman is actually scared of Scarecrow himself, but Scarecrow has used his fear toxin to debilitate and send the Dark Knight running on multiple occasions, and that makes him a unique foe that puts Batman in a position he doesn't often find himself in. Batman is a physical powerhouse with a mind that is exceedingly sharp, but his mind is also partially his biggest weakness because he he has some serious psychological issues, and Scarecrow's whole shtick is manipulating that kind of thing. When Scarecrow pops up on the scene, the Dark Knight knows that something terrifying is coming his way. Number 3. The Court of Owls Probably the oldest, most secretive, and most profitable group in Gotham City's underworld. When Bruce Wayne became a threat to them, they put Batman through one hell of a psychological ringer and possibly one of the darkest Batman stories ever. He gets trapped in a huge Court of Owls maze underneath Gotham City and trying to make his way through it, Batman goes through physical and psychological tests that nearly break the Dark Knight. But the court has so many feathers in all areas of Gotham and Bruce Wayne's own life. They may have even had a hand in the passing of his parents. Possibly. And we haven't even started talking about the Talons, a group of brainwashed and undead robot-like assassins. The combo of psychological warfare and the deadly Talons nearly brought Bruce Wayne to the pearly gates. Number 2. Bane His name says it all, as Bane has been the Bane of Batman on multiple occasions. The Bane we saw in the Dark Knight Rises movie was fantastic and he absolutely instilled fear in Batman, but the comic version of that same story goes to a whole other 
another level. With his master plan being even more well thought out and damaging to Batman, he unleashed Arkham Asylum on Gotham, putting Batman on the ropes as he has to chase down all the escaped criminals. Bane studied Batman. He utilizes his own weaknesses and completely destroys Batman, breaking his back in one of the most infamous comic book moments ever. More recently though, Bane brought Batman even lower than when he broke his spine because he broke Bruce's heart by snapping the neck of Alfred Pennyworth. Any battle Batman has fought against Bane has been with the help of his allies and that's because Batman knows that he can't take on Bane alone. Number 1. The Joker I think if there is one person who scares Batman more than anyone, it's got to be the Joker. They have had such a long and complex history with each other and I think because of that and the Joker's obsession with the Bat, Joker knows all the ways to mess with Batman and he's constantly coming up with new ones. He will go after anyone to get at Batman and he will go through anyone just for the fun of it. He's unpredictable. Batman never knows for sure where he will strike and what he will do unless the Joker wants Batman to know. Everything is a game, a game that he knows the rules to. The other thing about Joker is that he would never actually take the Dark Knight's life. In fact, I feel like he would probably destroy anyone who tries to. This just makes him more terrifying as he simply wants to be a constant cause of fear and anxiety for the Dark Knight, and he is. In a 10, Earth NR. On Earth NR, Johann Schmidt is the illegitimate son of Adolf, you know the one, who trained him to be one of his best generals. However, the man known as the Red Skull was considered dangerous even to him, him being Adolf. So when he tried to have him assassinated, the Red Skull retaliated by killing him in 1951. Red Skull then became the leader of the fascist regime until his death in 1984 at the hands of Punished Snake. Earth and R is also certainly an interesting Earth since Marvel, the original Captain Marvel, air quotes, is the son of Nora Kramir and Narvel, Kryptonian scientists that worked alongside the parents of Superman and are referred to as Kree, which is a slang term for Kryptonian. So apparently, some of these characters are combinations of DC heroes as well as Marvel heroes, but like aren't a part, they're not a part of the separate amalgam universe. I don't know, that was interesting to me. Number 9, Cynthia Sin Schmidt. Sin is the daughter of Red Skull, who for a time also adopted her father's mantle. She isn't an alternate in the way of being from an alternate reality, but she is an alternate version of of the Red Skull mantle. Her mother was a nameless washerwoman whom Red Skull had really no ties to himself, but simply used in an attempt to get an heir, disappointed when the child that they bore was born a girl. When she first rose to prominence, she greatly resembled her father's appearance, also boasting of a skeletal looking Red Skull face herself, which she actually got as a result of a fight with Bucky Barnes. During the Fear Itself story arc, she became one of the Serpent's chosen warriors, Scotty. Since then, however, her appearance has changed in the comics to the point that those who remember her from Fear Itself might not even recognize her anymore. Although, this was her original appearance in the sense of what she originally looked like. Cynthia now goes by the mantle of Sin and is looking much less frightening currently in comic continuity. Still, I don't think she's someone you would want to mess with, hence why she makes her cut. In at 8, Earth 92131. Earth 92131, also known as the Spider Man 90s animated universe, Red Skull was obsessed with creating and controlling a doomsday weapon that he had a German scientist build for him under New York City. After numerous battles with Captain America and the Six American and warriors, he and Cap became trapped in a vortex for 50 years. After those 50 years, the Red Skull's son, Reichenvolt Kragoff, freed him from the vortex and they found the Doomsday weapon and used it on Reidholt, which made him become Electro. After Electro betrayed the Red Skull, he tricked Spider-Man and Captain America into fixing the vortex in order to capture Electro. And after a battle, both Cap and the Skull were trapped in the vortex yet again. But he was later freed by the Beyonder to be a part of the Secret Wars. He recruited did Alistair Smythe and Dr. Octopus to help him in his bid to conquer Battle World, and he absolutely decimated the planet. So, yeah, I mean, he's a pretty bad dude. He was also returned to Earth by Dr. Doom with no memory of the events when Doom had stole the Beyonder's powers, but that means that he was free on Earth, which the, an the, 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 the animation couldn't continue to look into because it ended, unfortunately, like three episodes later. Anyway, he was also the adopted father of 
chameleon and then he turned his biological son into Electro. So that's some pretty serious villain juice, especially for an animated Saturday cartoon villain. Number 7. Golden Skull Golden Skull is from the alternate future of Earth 15061. His true identity remains unknown, although it was rumored that he was the son of another alternate Red Skull known as the Green Skull. If this is true, it's believed that he became the Golden Skull out of rebellion against his father and everything that he believed in. Golden Skull was known for being a recurring enemy and villain to Daniel Cage, the daughter of Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, and the all grown up alternate future version of Captain America. As his name implies, Golden Skull himself was obsessed with wealth, acting like the most capitalist version of the Red Skull. At one time he traveled to the past where his plan was actually to take control of the entirety of Earth's economy. Pretty big plan. And it's 6, a new future. On Earth 71500, Johann Schmidt, also known as the Red Skull, was at some point the leader of Hydra, obviously. But after Cap reached Hydra's headquarters and destroyed it, the two fought hard and they were both knocked out and frozen by Hydra. However, Natalia Romanova, the Black Widow of this reality, is also a member of the Avengers and Hydra. Natalia fought along with the other members of the Fantastic Four and the Avengers against Nathaniel Von Doom and his army, but she was badly injured by Sabretooth and Juggernaut. She recovered from this injury at a time where the current president was resigning and a new president was needed. So she went to the secret Hydra base where both Captain America and the Red Skull were kept frozen and she woke up Red Skull with a plan that she had managed to create when the current president resigned. And since Red Skull wanted to win the election, he disguised himself as Captain America. Yeah, you heard that right. On Earth 71500, Captain America is actually the Red Skull and started running for president under the guise of Captain America. Someone that every American could trust. Yeah, I'm sure you can figure out how that turned out. Number 5, White Skull. There have actually been a few White Skulls, but for the purpose of this list, I'll be talking about Colonel Bucky Barnes from the alternate reality of Earth 717. In this reality, we learn of what would happen if Captain America had lived during the American Civil War. Bucky himself becomes a villain in this universe, being a corrupt leader of the Union Red Legs Regiment, where soldier Stephen Rogers served. While tracking down Stephen, Buck interrupts an indigenous ritual meant to heal and transform Stephen Rogers. As a result, the skin on Colonel Barnes' face was burned off, revealing his white skull underneath, which is supposed to be symbolism, I think, for the fact that he's racist. Surviving the incident, Colonel Barnes would become the White Skull, the sworn enemy of Stephen Rogers, Captain America. In it for Captain Skull. Imagine a Captain America, but a fascist version. And not one that secretly works for Hydra, but literally one that is branded with fascist symbols and a black, white, and red color scheme instead of the classic all-American red, white, and blue. That's basically what Captain Skull is from Earth 613. This guy is literally just Captain Fascism, and that certainly seems scary to me. In fact, here's a quote from a version of Red Skull. I don't think it's this version, but it's still a quote nonetheless. Ah, my dear Captain, now you see who is stronger of us both. It is too bad that a symbol of freedom had to perish to see it. It is also too bad that I was insincere in that sentiment. Cause like, okay, so really that could just be a quote from the normal Red Skull, but hey, it fits this version well. While not much is known about this version of the character, it's certainly something that I personally believe that we should be afraid of. Number three, Ultimate Red Skull. In the reality of Earth 1610, known as the Ultimate Universe, Red Skull is actually the son of Captain America, Steven Rogers, and his then girlfriend, Gail Richards. While Captain America went MIA and was later declared dead, Gail was encouraged by the military to give up their baby and would end up marrying Steven's best friend, Bucky, after Steven went missing, obviously. Gail and Steven's child would be raised by the government and the military who planned to have him become the new Captain America eventually. Unfortunately, it turns out that raising a baby in a military base to become his long gone heroic father maybe isn't such a great idea. At the age of 17, the young man escaped and rebelled against his father's image, took a knife and cut the skin from his face, becoming the brilliant and evil villain known as the Red Skull. The really tragic thing is that Red Skull, while acquiring the Cosmic Cube and being captured before he could use it in this reality, revealed that the only reason that he'd wanted it to begin with was so that he could turn back time and prevent his father from being lost in the war, allowing him to grow up with a family and have a chance at a normal life with both his parents present. Not only is Red Skull of the Ultimate Universe terrifying, but he's also quite tragic as well. Penultimately, in at number two, Green Skull. Green Skull, aka Lex Luthor, is the amalgam of Marvel Comics Red Skull and DC Comics Lex Luthor. I mean, like, I'm, I'm guessing you could probably figure that based on his name and the title of this list. In the 1940s, Lex Luthor is a renowned entrepreneur and philanthropist 
who resides in Metropolis. He was married to Lois Lane, a war correspondent whom he met at a charity ball. Widely considered to be a model citizen and contributor to society, Luther is also personal friends with high ranking political figures such as Winston Churchill and President Franklin Roosevelt. Only Super Soldier, a World War II era superhero created by the US government, sees through his facade and knows that Luther is actually a corrupt war profiteer who is aiding the fascist party in an effort to prolong the war. While looking into the secret government project that created Super Soldier, Luther learns of an alien craft that landed in Kansas and carried a radioactive ore known as Green K, or the Kansas Load. I guess you can see where this is going. It's fucking kryptonite. In 1938, he arranged for fascist scientists to steal the ship and its cargo for him. Observing that the green meteorite weakens Super Soldier, Luther creates a serum from it, which he then promptly injects himself with. The result greatly extends his own lifespan, but inadvertently turns him into the Green Skull. So in essence, he tried to make himself walking kryptonite and got boned because of it. No pun intended, because you know, he's the skull. Skull is a bone. He got... Boned. Number one, Red Onslaught. Red Onslaught might seem like he's part of the main continuity for the character, and well, I mean, he sort of is, but even he is not the original Red Skull, as the original Johann Schmidt died long ago. Instead, Red Onslaught was actually born out of a clone version of the original Red Skull. So many clones, so little time. So even before he became Red Onslaught, he was technically an alternate version of sorts. This clone of Red Skull would go on to steal Professor X's brain after he was killed by Cyclops in Avengers vs. X Men. This would begin his journey towards becoming Red Onslaught, where Red Skull would then become merged with Onslaught via Professor X's brain. This basically all came about because Red Skull turned Genosha into a place where he enslaved and abducted both in humans and mutants. This obviously provoked Magneto, who attempted to kill Red Skull, but instead awoke a more powerful persona residing within him, Onslaught, thereby creating Red Onslaught. In order to defeat this devastating and deadly form, Scarlet Witch then cast a spell attempting to to reverse the alignment of Red Onslaught, which worked, but kinda accidentally resulted in the Axis event, where various heroes and villains had their alignments flipped. So, you know, solve one problem, create a bunch more. It's kinda how Wanda does, unfortunately. Dude.